Hello everybody, um, my name's Ellen Buckley and I am Tissue Viability Nurse Advisor at Coloplast and I'm really pleased to be able to present to you today a session on skin integrity um, and how to maintain a healthy skin integrity also. Um, so some of the learning objectives that we're going to cover throughout the session are that we're going to think about the structure and function of the skin, um, identify any factors that might affect the um, barrier function of the skin, um, be able to differentiate between some different skin conditions and also explore why it's important to maintain healthy skin. At Coloplast we like to keep things simple and certainly the three-step approach um, is no exception to that. Um, so we talk about the Coloplast three-step approach with step one being assessment. We need to have a really good assessment of our patient and our patient's wound um, to be able to identify any barriers to healing and identify management objectives that we need to incorporate into the patient's treatment plan. So once we've done our really robust assessment using a, um, an assessment framework such as the triangle of wound assessment, we then move on to step two which talks about preparation. If we identify bar barriers to healing, um, we need to remove those barriers in the most effective way possible and there are different ways that we can do that but if we don't remove those barriers by really effective wound bed preparation, then that wound is, um, is going to be delayed in healing potentially um, and healing won't be optimised with the treatment plan that we decide on. So one step we've done, uh, step two, is our wound bed preparation. We talk about our step three, which is our treatment, and that's our management plan. So when we've done our assessment to identify our objectives, we've removed any barriers to healing in step two by preparation of the wound. We then think about what we're going to use to progress that wound towards healing. What products, what dressings um, are we going to incorporate into that management plan? It's a really simple approach. So just some facts for you about the skin. Um, it's the largest organ in the body and actually the skin will renew itself every 28 days. Um, the thickness of the skin will vary depending on whereabouts on the body it is. Obviously thicker and thinner in different areas of the body. Uh, and every single minute 30,000 dead skin cells are actually shared from the skin. So the lipids or fats produced in the outer layer of the skin are really crucial um, in, in the epidermal barrier um, and this fatty barrier can really be easily disrupted by things such as soaps and detergents. An average person's skin when stretched, can be stretched to cover a two um, square metre um, surface area and actually that two square metres can contain more than 11 miles of blood vessels. And the skin has its own community of what we call microorganisms or skin flora. So what does the skin actually do? Well, it's an organ that protects the body um, from things like toxins, um, from UV light, from microorganisms. It also helps us maintain our body temperature um, through, um, you know, when we are very cold, for example, the blood vessels will, will constrict um, to try and reserve some heat. Um, it's also an organ of sensation, so all our nerve endings sit within the skin um, to help us feel things like pain. Um, metabolism, so the skin plays a really important role in metabolism as well by the production of um, vitamin D, um, melanin, and also we excrete waste um, from the skin as well through sweating. And it's how we communicate with people. You know, you, cannot, you can see often how somebody is feeling or what their emotions are just through um, looking, th looking at their face, for example. So it's a really good, uh, well, it's the organ that helps us communicate with other people. So let's look in a bit more detail at the structure of the skin and to be able to understand um, should the patient develop a wound, for example, we need to to be able to help that wound to heal and do a really good assessment of that patient, we need to understand a little bit um, about, what, um, about the structure of the skin and how the skin is made up. So the skin essentially consists of three layers, with the top outermost layer being the epidermis, the dermis being the middle layer, um, which has got multiple functions because of the different variety of structures that sit within the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue at the, bo at the bottom will provide insulation and cushioning for the body.
So the epidermis is the outermost uh, visible part of the skin. Um, its thickness will vary depending on where it is on the body. Um, thicker in some areas of the body, thinner on some areas of the body. Um, and what does the epidermis do? Well, it provides a barrier function and it can has a responsibility for controlling water loss as well. Uh, it protects us against things like UV light, bacteria and allergens. So the epidermis skin barrier function is a really highly specialised structure and it will very much adapt to the environmental conditions that surround it. Um, it provides not only a physical barrier but also a chemical barrier as well to block entry of things like foreign substances um, and it will trigger an immunological response against any pathogens that might penetrate that barrier. You may have seen an image like this when um, listening to people speak about the epidermis um, previously and it's called sort of like the bricks and mortar model um, and this is how we talk about the epidermis. So the bricks being the cornea sites, um, the mortar being the um, intracellular lipid matrix and all linked together by the desmosomes and this is what healthy epidermal, um, epidermal barrier would look like. So there is an epidermal cell turnover and the stratum corneum, which is the very much outer layer of the epidermis, um, is constantly being renewed because dead epidermal cells are continually shed from the stratum corneum. In healthy skin, this takes around four to six weeks um, for those epidermal cells to what we call differentiate. So they gradually move up from the stratum basal through the stratum spinosum through the stratum granulosum very much to the top of the stratum corneum and then they are shed. And it's renewed about every 15 days for individuals who have healthy skin. So moving on to the dermis, it's the middle layer of the skin and it's around 15 to 40 times thicker than the epidermal layer that we were just talking about. It's made up of connective tissue which is like a semi-fluid type substance and that semi-fluid substance is made up of collagen and elastin fibres. But as you can see from the image here, there are lots of other structures that sit within the dermal layer as well, um, like nerve endings and blood vessels and other appendages like hair follicles, sebaceous glands and sweat glands also sit within the dermis. So derm the dermis, um, as we know, has our nerve endings and they're responsible for our sensation. So the skin is a very sensory organ and we co it collects information because it's a sensory organ. So these nerve stru structures provide vital information about touch and pressure perhaps or pain. Um, and the location of the sensory nerves deeper in the dermis could explain why some superficial wounds are often more painful than those with more tissue loss. Sebum and sweat um, within the dermis um, create an acidic environment on the surface of the skin and in terms of pH that would be between around about 4 and 6 and that's what we refer to as the acid mantle. In non-healing wounds um, we know that there can be an alkaline pH and it's been shown that skin heals more rapidly when, it's, when exposed to an acidic environment more than uh, a neutral or more alkaline environment which is possibly one of the reasons why wounds become more hard to heal if they have an alkaline environment. So if there's damage to the dermis, such as full thickness wounds, this is characterised by loss of dermis and can take a long time to heal because the process of tissue repair is actually really quite complex. The structures within the dermis, such as the sweat glands and hair, hair follicles, are permanently lost in full thickness wounds. And dermis in healed skin doesn't really have the same structure or function of that of skin that was of dermis that was there before the skin was injured, because it's replaced with scar tissue instead. So when we talk about subcutaneous tissue, um, this is the lower layer or the bottom layer of the skin and sits between the dermis and fascia. Subcutaneous fatty tissue can sometimes be visible at the base of, of quite deep wounds, such as pressure ulcers or traumatic wounds. And the functions of subcutaneous tissue are essentially insulation, it provides cushioning and will retain moisture. So just to summarise the function and structure of the skin, um, it has lots of different functions which are, are obviously very important, such as protection and maintenance of body temperature. And we've discussed the fact that it's made up of three different layers, the epidermis, the dermis and the subcutaneous layer. So we're now going to talk, move on to talk about um, factors which might affect that skin barrier function and there are lots of different factors which could affect how the skin works. Um, but we put these into two different classifications. 
factors that are internal and factors that are external. So if we talk about these in a bit more detail, some internal factors might be, um, you know, the age, so neonatal skin is very, very different to elderly skin, for example. External factors might be uh, medication has an effect on skin barrier function or the environment might have an effect. So we need to take all of these things into consideration. So genetics and hormones can have an effect on the skin as well. A person's you know, genetic makeup can determine their diff what skin type they have and can have a significant effect on the condition of that patient's skin. Sometimes skin changes can appear in response to hormones like oestrogen or testosterone. So again, lots of different things can have an effect on the skin. Age. So skin ageing can have a gradual decline in barrier function, making the skin much more vulnerable. The dermis will become thinner, so we get reduced elasticity and increase the risk of skin tears, for example. The subcutaneous layer can also become much thinner, reducing the protection that it provides the body against mechanical injury. And cell turnover rate um, and sebum secre secretion that we talked about before can slow down in the elderly, resulting in you know, delayed healing and increased risk of inflammation for a patient. So elderly skin can have fewer sebaceous glands, which means that there is a reduced secretion of those natural moisturisers. Um, there will be flattening of the ridges that holds the dermis and the epidermis together. And again, that will increase the risk of skin tears in elderly skin. Alternatively, neonates, premature babies have very fragile, much more thinner, immature skin than full-term babies, um, resulting in a higher rate of transepidermal water loss. So in a full-term baby, um, the stratum corneum is tw 10 to 20 layers thick, but in a premature baby, there will only be two to three layers of um, stratum corneum. So the overall result is that Babies that are preterm are more prone to things like skin trauma from adhesive tapes and dressings. So if you look at this graph here, just to put it into context about where on the pH scale the human skin will sit, you can see here that human skin sits between 5 and 6 on the pH scale. Patients who have an impaired nutritional status um, will also have altered structural integrity of their skin and an impaired uh, biological function. So we need to bear that in mind as well. Micronutrients like vitamins and minerals for skin health have been highlighted in clinical studies as being really, really integral to skin health. Um, and deficiencies and toxicities can also disturb the barrier function in the skin. Medication can also have an effect and some medications will cause skin changes. We need to bear that in mind when we're doing an assessment of a patient. You know, what medications are they taking that might have an effect on their skin integrity? Dryness is one of the most common side effects of medications. Things such as diuretics and laxatives can cause skin to be drier. And long-term steroid use we know is often associated with um, skin thinning and delayed wound healing. What about lifestyle and environment? Well, healthy lifestyle choices will also help um, preserve skin health um, and exercise and sleep being really, really important factors in, in um, our skin being healthy. Things like smoking and high alcohol consumption can have negative impact on the skin. Sunlight, for example, in moderation is good, um, but too much sun can, uh, can conversely um, damage the skin as well. When the skin is dry, um, the function of the acid mantle that we talked about before is reduced and that means that there's reduced protection against things like bacteria um, and you know, dry skin can often be very itchy so if a patient is scratching their skin they perhaps will cause trauma and again it will increase the risk of infection for a patient. So what causes dry skin? Well, comorbidities can cause dry skin, any kinds of inflammatory skin condition like psoriasis or eczema, um, ageing, poor skin hygiene, medications as we've already discussed. So we need to look at all of these things as to what might be causing that skin to be dry. Prolonged exposure to moisture on the skin as well can also cause us a problem. Um, you know, overhydration of the epidermis can cause it to swell. So prolonged exposure to moisture can cause perhaps the epidermis to be stripped away. And the epidermis being the outer layer, being stripped away increases the risk of secondary infection and potentially further skin damage. Once the epidermis is damaged, you know, serous fluid or exudate will leak out, which can potentially cause maceration and possibly damage to deeper layers of the skin. And these effects can alter the ability of the skin to withstand um, things like um, damage from friction, um, shear or pressure.
Moisture associated skin damage or MASD is an umbrella term that we use to describe damage that could be caused by the skin to the skin by moisture or prolonged exposure to moisture and we split this into four different categories. So we might talk about incontinence associated dermatitis which is obviously damage that could potentially be caused to the skin by prolonged exposure to urine or feces. Um, peri-wound moisture dermatitis, so a prolonged exposure to wound exudate perhaps. Um, ITD or intertriginous dermatitis or intertrigo you might call it, um, so moisture damage within skin folds. Or peristomal moisture associated skin damage which is um, prolonged exposure to urine or faeces around a stoma. So there are certain things that we need to do to help maintain healthy skin, such as protect ourselves from the sun, making sure that we treat our skin, you know, gently really, you know, not over soak in the bath, um, apply moisturisers, make sure that we eat a healthy diet and a balanced and varied diet is really, really important in maintaining skin health. Making sure that, you know, we manage our stress, perhaps it's not always easy, but uncontrolled stress can, you know, make the skin more sensitive um, and can trigger things like acne and other skin problems. So just to summarise about maintaining healthy skin integrity, um, we know that the most important function of the skin is to protect the body from the external environment. And there are lots of different factors that can contribute from the, for the skin not being able to do all of the functions that we've already discussed. Um, we need to understand what those issues might be because potentially we could prevent um, them from causing us a problem. We want to maintain that skin barrier function in clinical practice for our patients because skin breakdown is largely so just to review the learning objectives that we talked about at the beginning of the session, we've talked about the structure and function of the skin, we've looked at the different factors that could affect the barrier function of the skin, um, we've had a look at a few different skin conditions um, and also we've been able to think about how we can maintain skin health for ourselves and our patients. Thank you so much for watching the session today and hopefully I'll see you again soon.